Hi class, uh, so we're here for the second part of lecture today. So uh, we've been talking about how we can look for records of the history of life uh, on Earth, and in particular the fossil record of life that tells us how life has grown and changed over the course of Earth's history. Uh, that will give us clues for how to look for the records of life uh, elsewhere in the cosmos, in particular here in our own solar system, and we'll come back to that uh, next week when we start talking about that sort of stuff. So for this part of the lecture, uh, so we talked about the fossil record. Um, I just want to talk about the history of life on Earth um, in very brief detail. Um, the history of life on Earth is important to understand because it tells us something about um, how life changes and what kinds of aspects we might look for um, and things that might cause challenges for us in identifying life. Um, in our search elsewhere. So part of that discussion will be a discussion of extinction events. We'll come to that right at the end. So in the image you see behind me, uh, this is called the KT boundary. Okay, so this white strip you can see across here, it's actually only about the width of my finger, uh, but this is a close-up image, okay? Uh, so this is the image I took. You can actually see this in the rock. Uh, so this is the boundary of the uh, event, the meteorite impact, uh, that was responsible for the extinction of the dinosaurs and much other life on Earth at that time. Okay, so we'll we'll talk about that uh, in uh, near the end of the near the end of the presentation. Okay, so let's uh, let's start a few slides here, and we will um, get going. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a very uh, famous style of picture that you'll see uh, shown. Uh, this is usually called the geologic spiral. Um, it starts uh, with the formation of the Earth way down there at the bottom, and it spirals up over the uh, eons of time uh, until you get to the present day. You can see that the various names for the geologic eras are labeled as you go along there. Um, I, th I think it's useful and interesting to uh, see because you can see there uh, where they've marked uh, much of the life forms that can and, and do appear in the fossil record of Earth's history. And what you see is that almost all of it is concentrated very recently in the last billion years or so. Uh, through much of Earth's history, even though there's life, you can see Archaeans written uh, down there near the bottom, um, it has not been as prolific and as diverse as we see it today in the modern, uh, in the modern age. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit here during this discussion. So uh, just as the last time uh, that you could spend an entire quarter, if not longer, talking about uh, the history of life on Earth, we're not going to do that. We're just going to talk about a couple of the milestone events that are important to the development of life and will kind of give us some information uh, to put in our back pocket and use in the search for life elsewhere. Um, I'll mention a couple innovations that life created here on Earth. Uh, those are interesting things to ponder because they will uh, almost certainly be different. Uh, innovations that other life elsewhere finds, but it's interesting to ask whether or not they find similar adaptations as we've seen here on Earth. Um, and then uh, lastly, I want to talk about extinction events. Extinction events in particular uh, will come back to particularly later in the quarter when we start talking about intelligent life and the Drake equation because it plays a big role there, okay? So um, the first thing I'll say is that the origin of life is completely unknown, okay? so. Abiogenesis is the process by which life arises from non-living matter. Um, we think this happened. We don't have any idea how it happens. We've never made an experiment in the laboratory where it happens. So we have no idea what this actually is. And what that really means is when we go back in the fossil record, we have no idea when the very first moment life occurred in, and we should not see life before and only see life after that point in the fossil record, okay? This is the single largest mystery in our quest to understand life in the cosmos. And it appears in the Drake equation, which we talked about during the first week and we'll come back to again later in the quarter, that, that uh, number, FL, the fraction of planets that develop life, that's really what that number is all about. It's how likely is it that abiogenesis happens. If you start with a lifeless environment, then how often is it uh, the case that life spontaneously develops from non-living matter? Okay, so this is the biggest mystery. We're not going to talk about it because we don't know the answer to it um, and we don't have any good ideas either. Well, life scientists may, but for that we certainly don't. 
Okay, so um, I'll remind you that uh, what the last time we talked, we talked about stromatolites, okay? So the oldest known stromatolites um, are the earliest form of life that we know of in the fossil record from about 3.48 billion years ago, or 3.7, if you uh, believe in the Greenland stromatolite. But the thing that you should bear in mind is that we found both of these stromatolite fossils. And the Earth is a big freaking place. Most of it's underwater. Most of it's places where we haven't explored and done for fossils. But we still found the stromatolite fossils. And so what that suggests is even though the stromatolites date back to 3.48 billion years or 3.7 billion years, stromatolites, cyanobacteria that the, the formed the mats that became the stromatolites, must have arisen much earlier than that number. Okay. Otherwise, it couldn't have been so become so widespread that it made enough stromatolites that it's easy for us to find them when we go looking for them in the fossil record. Okay. So the origin of life is almost certainly sooner than uh, 3.48 billion years ago. Okay. Now the Earth is only 4.5 billion years, and so what that tells us is somewhere very soon after the Earth formed, we think life formed. Okay, or at least started started surviving on planet Earth, and so that's a very interesting statement to ponder uh, when we start asking ourselves whether or not life is common in the universe or not. Okay, if it formed very soon after the Earth formed and not just like a million years ago, um, then is it easy to create life, or is there something that happened that made uh, it very easy to create life at that particular moment on Earth, and does that happen all the time? We don't know. Okay, but the point is, is that very soon after the Earth formed, life apparently appeared. Okay, now the last uh, last class period, we talked about the nature of the Earth at this time, and you'll remember we said that the Earth was largely volcanic, and the atmosphere was dominated by CO2. Okay, so the cyanobacteria are photosynthetic, and what they do is they use CO2 as their raw material, okay, together with energy from the sun. Uh, to do their lifey business, okay? And the waste product of that is O2, oxygen, molecular oxygen. Now, the early Earth had virtually no oxygen. It was all bound up in, in water, uh, in CO2, everything around. But the cyanobacteria, when it uh, developed, it started creating oxygen as a byproduct. Okay, so over time, the amount of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere steadily increases. Okay, and so uh, from three, at least 3.5 billion years ago when the stromatolites appeared to about 2.7 billion, years, or sorry, 2.4 billion years ago, the oxygen built up until we reach what's called the Great Oxygen Crisis. Okay, and so that was a time where the amount of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere became so concentrated that it became toxic to bacteria that weren't used to existing and dealing with an oxygen environment. Okay, and so the Great Oxygen Crisis caused a great die-off. Okay, and these die-offs happen all the time in nature. Uh, they happen whenever the environment changes dramatically and a life form that has adapted itself to thriving in that environment suddenly can't find itself able to find food, compete, make energy, propagate, replicate, do anything that it needs to do, then it dies off. And oxygen was an anathema to lots of the bacteria at this time. And so the great oxygen crisis was when the oxygen finally became dense enough uh, that it started threatening the existence of much of the bacteria, okay? So bacteria that were aerobic um, suddenly found themselves able to compete. So oxygen up to that point had been a um, rare commodity, and so there was only a little bit of aerobic bacteria that used oxygen for their processes. Uh, but suddenly, when the oxygen crisis happened, there was plenty of oxygen. And so as the anaerobic bacteria died off, the aerobic bacteria found that they could fill in the gaps because there was plenty of oxygen and there was no competition from the anaerobic bacteria. Okay, so this was the time that the first eukaryotes appeared, okay? So you and I are eukaryotes. We are multicellular creatures. We use oxygen. We breathe in oxygen. Our waste product is carbon dioxide, which is what's used by things like the cyanobacteria, okay? So this is where the eukaryotes appeared, and they developed this kind of 
um, I wouldn't call it a symbiotic relation, but, but this relationship where we're using the waste product of cyanobacteria and they're using our waste product and the ecosystem found a new stability as a result. Now, multicellular organisms, you'll remember when we discussed the tree of life that eukaryotes are the uh, tree where you have multicellular organisms like you and I. They appeared about 2.1 billion years ago. Um, now, the very first multicellular organisms that appeared were all duplicates of each other. So it's like your skin, right? Your skin cells are a gigantic multicellular uh, complex, but they're all skin cells. They're all the same. And it wasn't until about 1.2 billion years ago when red algae appeared. And in red algae, they are multicellular, but the different cells have different purposes in the organism. Okay, so multicellular organisms started very soon after the eukaryotes kind of started uh, gaining dominance uh, after the great oxygen crisis, uh, but it took another billion years uh, before they discovered that it's useful to have different kinds of cells doing different kinds of things together. And that's certainly the norm today. You and I have very different cells throughout our bodies that do all kinds of different things. Uh, but in the beginning, that's not the way it was at all. Okay. Now the other, uh, so this is part of the diversification. This is part of the adaptation of the microbes. They're losing, learning to use different byproducts, uh, different uh, environmental products that they find, in this case oxygen um, instead of CO2. Um, they are uh, diversifying their cellular structure and their cellular function. Okay, so all that's happening here. But the other thing that the microbes discovered is that in order to adapt to a changing environment, you have to do many experiments with your form and function to figure out which ones are gonna survive the best. Okay, you basically have to mutate a lot. You remember that movie we watched of the bacteria uh, growing across the table. Anytime they hit the strong antibiotic region, it took a while for the bacterial colonies to experiment until it created one that was able to survive in the high, high density uh, antibiotic environment. Okay, well, it's basically the same thing here. The bacteria have to learn to deal with, to live in these new environments, and so they just kind of kind of keep evolving, they keep changing, and sometimes their evolutions work, and they propagate, and they survive, and they thrive. Sometimes they don't, and all of those die off. Okay, so evolution is always a process in failed experiments. Well, one of the things the bacteria discovered around this time is what's called conjugation. So conjugation is where bacteria kind of uh, join or uh, have an exchange process where they can exchange genetic material. And it was very quickly discovered that, that was a way of uh, propagating very effectively. And that eventually evolved into what we today call sex. So the, the exchange of genetic material uh, between uh, uh, sexual partners is what provides lots of opportunity for there to be lots of experiments for every single generation of uh, organisms that propagate. You and I are not identical copies of each other the way a bacteria subdivided itself is an identical copy of its parents. You and I are both mutants, a mixture of the genetic material that came from each of our parents. And so the bacteria are the ones who discovered that sex was a good way to uh, produce mutations. And so that allowed for very quick experimentation. And we saw very rapid evolution in the life forms uh, once that appeared in the uh, operational playbook. Uh, for life forms. Now, life kind of existed in cellular form for a long time. Uh, the eukaryotes eventually, as we said, uh, discovered multicellular function. Uh, it wasn't until just about a billion years ago that they discovered multicellular function with many different types of, uh, of operations working together. But uh, they were still just bacteria, right? So red algae is a very simple uh, organism. It's not that much different than the algae that was there before it. And so life kind of existed and kind of went along its way for another 500 million years or so. But then there was a great event in the Earth's uh, history, okay? And that event is called the Cambrian Explosion. It happened about 541 million years ago. And basically what happened is uh, life forms discovered that another source of raw material was each other. So they started preying on each other, okay? And that predation uh, combined with the very quick evolution that was happening 
uh, cause the diversific diversification of many forms of life. So in particular, when you look at uh, the post-Cambrian explosion, you see lots of very complex multicellular organisms, including big ones like us. So you see trilobites and uh, sea sponges and uh, you know uh, anemones and all kinds of weird stuff out there, okay? Um, so that diversification happened in the large organisms, and they very quickly adapted to the fact that they were being preyed on. They developed things like armor. Other organisms developed different behaviors, right? So they started burrowing into uh, the subsurface floor of the oceans, which previously had only been inhabited by bacteria. Okay, and so that also caused uh, evolutionary traits. And so um, all of these things happened because the life forms started interacting with each other in new ways that caused pressure on the environment that the life forms found themselves in. And so evolution took over. And so uh, life forms that could survive the new environment, I'm being chased by some other organism, I am uh, able to hide better from that, I am able to utilize this niche that was uh, abandoned when the sharks ate all the whatever used to live here, whatever, right? All of those processes drive the explosion of life that we saw during the, the, the Cambrian explosion, okay? Now, the thing to remember about the Cambrian explosion is that it's a unique moment in the history of the Earth. We have never seen the sudden diversification of life like we saw at the Cambrian explosion. And so the interesting question is, what caused it? We still don't know exactly why the Cambrian explosion happened when it did. We think it's uh, related to the fact that uh, the organisms discovered that they could eat each other. That's certainly a factor, but were there other environmental factors? Are there other things that happened? Um, these are still open questions. And, and the point is, is that the diversification of life that we see today, where there are zillions of species on planet Earth, um, originated really here in the, pre in the Cambrian explosion, because this is where the gigantic diversification of form and function that led to animals and plants and all those different things that we see today really happened. And so the question is, is what caused it? And are the events that caused it, are they common? Do they happen on other worlds? Or is this a really unique thing that only happened here on Earth? Okay, that will inform whether or not we expect to find really diverse and widely varying types of life elsewhere in the universe, or whether or not we might find uh, places like Earth where there's this extraordinary diversity in form and function and type of life that we see. Okay? Now, this picture uh, of the Cambrian explosion here, there are plenty of things in this picture that are not around today. Okay? And that is because uh, nature is prolific. There are far more species that have ever existed uh, over the history of the earth than exist today. Nature is basically doing experiments and it has produced a long litany of experiments. What if life's like this? Will it survive? Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Okay, and you can see there in the bottom picture, uh, the trilos, they're my favorites. Okay, the trilobites lived on Earth for 300 million years. Okay, that's a pretty successful run, right? Whatever nature did when it created the trilobites, they were happy and existed and did great for 300 million years. But there's not a single one of them left today, which means at some point, whatever their adaptations to survival on Earth was, it failed them and they became extinct. Okay, and this happens all the time. There are plenty of things we see in the fossil record that no longer exist because they have failed and been selected to expire uh, by nature in the long process of uh, natural selection. Okay, now extinctions happen all the time. We see extinctions in the record. We see, see creatures for small periods of time and then there's no more. And then we see them for other periods of time, uh, different creatures, and then they're no more. But one of the interesting things about the fossil record is when you look at the fossil record, there have been mass extinctions where significant fractions of all the species on Earth um, perish. Okay, so there are historically six mass extinctions in the uh, fossil record. Uh, so these are their names, the times, and the percentage of species loss. So the oldest one we see in the fossil record uh, is after the Cambrian explosion. 
okay? So 450 to 440 million years ago, the Ordovician Silurian uh, uh, extinction event, where we lost about 60 or 70% of all the species on Earth, okay? Uh, 375 million years ago, there was the late Devonian extinction, where we lost 70% of all the species that were there on Earth. Okay, so what happens when that happens, right? So when an extinction event happens, 70% of all the species die on Earth, okay? But there's 30% of all the species on Earth left, and they diversify again. There are suddenly niches, uh, places in the ecosystem that are not filled. There used to be species there, but now there aren't. And so the species that are left, they diversify and they spread out across the planet and they fill in all those niches again. Okay, so between the uh, Ord Ord uh, Ordovician Silurian event and the late Devonian extinction, the species that survived the first extinction diversified, but then a whole bunch of them became extinct when we got to the late Devonian uh, extinction. Okay. The next extinction happened 252 million years ago. That's called the Permian-Triassic extinction. That was the largest extinction in the history of the Earth. We lost 90 to 95 percent of all the species on Earth. Okay, so only uh, four or five percent of the species on Earth survived that. Okay, um, vertebrate evolution, for instance, <clears throat> was well on its way to happening at that time, but it took like 30 million years for uh, vertebrate evolution to continue after uh, the Permian Triassic event. Okay, so that was a devastating extinction event. Uh, it killed an enormous amount of life on Earth in a very short period of time, and it took a long time for it to diversify. Uh, there's the next extinction, it's called the Triassic Jurassic extinction. That's 201.3 million years ago. We lost again about 75% of the species. Um, and then the last extinction in the list here is called the Cretaceous Paleogene. Uh, extinction, uh, but many of you may know it by uh, a previous name, which is called the KT event, uh, and that happened just 66 million years ago, where we lost 75% of all the species on Earth, including the dinosaurs, okay? So the KT event uh, is named, uh, or the CP extinction, uh, was called the KT event because there's this geologic boundary that you can see in the rocks called the KT boundary. Okay, and so uh, this is a picture. So you can see it at various places around the country. Uh, this is a picture in southern Colorado. Uh, there's a place there called Trinidad Lake State Park where I went to visit and you can see it. So uh, above the tree there, you can see this overhanging shelf of rock and then there's a thin white layer uh, there and that is the so-called KT boundary. So it's not very thick. It's only about an inch thick. So you can see there on the right, uh, my pocket knife is uh, sitting there on top of it. Um, and you can see it's a very thin layer. That layer is very rich in iridium. And what uh, the KT boundary is, is it is the layer of material laid down after the Earth was hit by about a 10 kilometer wide asteroid. Okay, so this hit in what is now called the Yucatan Peninsula. It threw up a dust pal over the entire planet. It basically caused something that those of you who are from my generation, we used to call nuclear winter, but uh, it uh, caused a dramatic uh, uh, dying at the time. It killed all the dinosaurs. It killed just tremendous numbers of life forms. And the life forms that survived that event um, are the ones that evolved into all the diversity that we see in the biosphere today. Okay, now um, the, the reason this event is known or is associated with the dinosaurs is that if I go into the rocks and I look for dinosaur fossils, I can always find where the KT boundary was and dinosaur fossils only occur below the KT boundary. There are no dinosaur fossils above the KT boundary. So when, when people, uh, when we quote, when we know when all the dinosaurs died, that's because we know the age of the KT boundary and so we know we find dinosaur fossils below that. Okay, okay. Now, if you uh, have been paying attention, you will notice that I only listed five mass extinctions, uh, but I said there had been six in the Earth's history. Uh, and the reason for that is we are currently in the middle of a mass extinction event. Um, it's called the Holocene extinction. Uh, it started about 1900, so that's uh, just over 100 years ago. And it seems clear that it is associated with human activity here on Earth. Um, the way we uh, uh, know uh, that it's associated with our activity is if you look at the uh, rate at which extinctions happen. Uh, so historically, over the last 1,000, uh, 10,000 years, 
Um, the, in the last hundred years, species are going extinct at a rate about a thousand times faster than that uh, historical average that we see. So this is associated with humans' uh, impact on the environment, with decrease in habitation, with uh, pollutants, uh, with global warming, uh, climate change, all these sorts of things are contributing uh, to the Holocene extinction. Uh, and so uh, this is very, very certainly due to human activity. We don't know what the extent of it's going to be. It is certainly ongoing. Um, and there are interesting questions to be asked about whether or not uh, we can do something to stop, it, uh, stop the extinction from happening. Okay. Uh, if you would like to read more about extinction events, there is an absolutely fantastic book called The Sixth Extinction and Unnatural History uh, by Elizabeth Colbert. Uh, it's actually about the Holocene extinction, but she talks about all the uh, previous extinctions as well. Um, she won a Pulitzer Prize for that book, uh, so it's a very good book uh, and an excellent read if you're interested in this sort of thing. Okay. Okay, so that is all I'm going to say uh, about the... Uh, 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 History of Life on Earth. Uh, you can read a little bit about uh, this in the book as well. It's um, as equally brief as our discussion here, uh, but it's set all the framework we need now. So uh, the last thing we'll talk about on Friday, we're going to talk about um, the kind of extreme forms of life uh, that we see on Earth, uh, and then we will finally at last take our leap out into the solar system. Okay, so I hope you're all doing well. Take care of yourselves, and we'll see you next time.